Scenes from Gaza you won't see anywhere else. Now, as you can see, they're relying on the donkey carts. A British national chose to stay to help however he could. I'm OK. It's been quite a day, to be honest. For weeks now, he's been showing us these exclusive snapshots of life on the edge. Hardy has been practicing jumping from a chair and landing on his feet. Hello, Hardy. We first made contact with Mohammed Galini on October the 12th, just hours after the evacuation orders from Israel's defense forces. Since then, he's been sending us videos that break down the reality of surviving in Gaza. We've received news that um, everyone in Gaza is to depart by 5 p.m. I am worried for what's to come. Our car it can only take five, so we might have to, the elderly and more infirm will go, in, go by car, and I will probably go in a group with the people that are able to walk. We've seen, like, awful scenes of people just coming from Gaza on foot. The view of a man who made a most extraordinary decision. British national Mohammed Galini, an air quality scientist from Manchester. He was in Gaza on vacation when the war started, was permitted to leave through Rafa weeks ago, but he didn't go. You had a chance to leave and you took your family to Rafa, but you didn't go. And I think that's a decision that a lot of people would say, what, what on earth, why didn't you leave? Yeah, I mean, people in Gaza are asking me the same thing, actually. Mm. Hard to imagine making that call. He knows the danger, was really worried for his family, his dad in particular. My dad, he gets quite anxious. We'd sleep in the same room, I'd sleep next to him, and um, when a bomb went off, I found myself kind of reaching for his hand, and, and I, but you know what? I didn't know if it was for me or for him, because I think it was probably a bit of both. We had news today that my dad and my brothers will uh, be traveling. Their names are on the list. My name is there also, but I've decided I'm staying. Uh, we're on our way to the border now. Uh, my dad, brothers, uh, and my name has come up. They're, um, they're just saying goodbye to, to people. We've been here for about seven hours, maybe, uh, and yes, we've just been told categorically that there won't be any uh, travel today. People are quite, people are quite upset, understandably. I've just said goodbye to my father and stepmother and family. I feel like I'm in a position to make a difference. How? I have like skills that can help in a crisis like this. I, I'm a Qualified first aider. I'm very practical, so I know how to, you know, get things working. Just kind of keep things ticking. Are you okay? By the way, are you? I'm okay. It's been like uh, it's been quite a day, to be honest. This is the Khanunis High Street. I don't even know what happened here. Like you can't even keep track. We connected with Galini several times over the last few weeks. Hi, this is Mohamed Galayini. As he it's moved from Gaza City to Han Yunus and got ready to move again. Part of the vast human wave constantly squeezed further south as ordered by Israel's defense forces. Hi, it's Mohamed. It's the 8th of November. It's the 13th of November. I think it's the 36th day of the war now. He'd send in videos, answer questions by WhatsApp. This is very stressful. And found a moment for a brief interview. What happens? Like, I'm just curious as you and I are talking, where are you getting your power from? How are you watching the TV? I'm at a, a, a youth uh, empowerment organization through donations. We have a lovely bank of power, solar power, uh, and batteries. I'm actually sitting on a battery right now, so I'm, I'm at the source of power. Yeah. yeah, so this was bombed a few weeks ago now. Yeah, we've lost track, everything's destroyed. Usually, um, garbage disposal will be by cars, but now, as you can see, they're relying on the donkey carts. The median age in Gaza is 18, so many little ones in harm's way. Beyond trying to keep them safe and feeling safe, there's the constant need to try to lift their spirits. Okay, so Hadi 
has been practicing jumping from a chair and landing on his feet. Yellow heavy. Galini says if all he could do was keep the kids entertained, he'd feel useful. Uh, these guys have actually not been out of the house for a while, so I'm taking them for a little walk to the um, to the shop. To be out is getting riskier even in Han Yunus, the IDF's operations seemingly expanding. It's getting harder to figure out where to go and harder to feel safe. Avoid crowds. People are afraid with being in proximity to anyone that they don't know, lest that person be on a target. That's terrorizing, basically. You don't know where it's going to come from, and everyone's afraid of everyone else now as much as they are of the Israelis. Crowds, though, unavoidable sometimes. Five pharmacies, he says he had to try to get the most basic of medicine. This pharmacy had a different dosage, and uh, so this is like one half of a month's supply. And it's worse if you want water. So this is the daily struggle to get water, filling these containers to then fill up the water container. The guy goes around like calling fresh water, fresh water. I'm now in my grandfather's apartment, but he died 30 years ago. I'm here with four, 13 of my cousins, two families, nine children. We're lucky to have an actual kitchen, that's our drinking water on the right. The fridge is just a glorified food cupboard because we've had no electric power since a month now. That's our empty gas canister. There is one outside that's full, but we don't know what we'll do when that runs out. What is okay today may not be tomorrow. He says he knows his family is lucky to have access to resources, but for how long? And for how long can you keep fear at bay? I was asked if I was afraid. I'm not really afraid. I know that like death or serious injury is a possibility, but like I'm not really afraid. I'm more dejected, tired, angry. Yeah, there were events that day that I can't stand by, but can the world stand by what Israel is doing to us? The political is personal, and in a one day at a time existence, living in Gaza right now takes every ounce of energy. Hope? sort of luxury only a few can afford. So Mohammed left us a voice message today. He says seven more relatives from his extended family are now sheltering with him. That includes several children with another expected soon. So that's 25 people in one house. We are, of course, staying in touch with him as best as possible. There have been days with no internet, no communication at all. But as we get updates, we will pull them together for you. Next, the family of the London attack victims await a crucial sentence. For me, the, the terrorism label will bring some measure of security. They talk with us about how they're coping after a horrific tragedy. Next. In a television exclusive, relatives of the Avzal family talk about the trial of the man who ran down and killed four of their loved ones. I miss them so much because I wanted to go to them and tell them we got justice for you. They're convinced many Canadians will be safer if the judge calls his crimes an act of terror. Whoever is out there with murderous intent, they may think uh, twice. Ali and Hina Islam watched the trial in Windsor in person and by Zoom reliving the grief and anger they have carried for more than two years. This is about the justice they still crave and their love for the ones they lost. I lost an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a friend. They were my only other family in London. and I always Leave it to the kids to say it with such clarity. This is a memorial video and it is brutally beautiful. I miss our family dinners. And this is Aisha Islam, there with Yumna Avzal, her cousin. They were so little, there was so much more. Aisha's parents, Ali and Hena Islam, looking on. The way they made my brothers and I feel. And really, they haven't been able to look away or think of anything else since that terrible day, June 6, 2021. A man in a pickup truck driving into their family, murdering Yumna, her mom, Madiha, her dad, Salman, her grandmother, Talat. Just Yumna's little brother survived. 
The murderer tried and convicted, sentencing still to come. Healing? That seems so far off. I think most Canadians who think about them have, you know, the single image in their head of that, that one photograph. Help us understand uh, who, who they were, who they still are to you. Uh, it's almost as if you were going to uh, choose uh, someone for a TV role um, and you wanted a decent family. This would be it. They're almost like plucked out of a fictional Mayberry. Um, you could not beat them for niceness. It's, it's just impossible. Um, Salman, in his job, touched many senior citizens as a role, uh, as, a, as a physiotherapist in that role. Um, worked at several nursing homes taking care of our most frail citizens. Mediha, uh, uh, an engineer, uh, trying to get her PhD, uh, doing uh, environmental uh, research, often the, f the only uh, woman in her class. Yumna, uh, what a talent, what an artist. Uh, and Ati Talit, just uh, a wonderful matriarch for that, uh, for that household. They, they kept others in their hearts, and it was the most beautiful thing about them. It wasn't just one person, but every single person mm -hmm. in that family. And when I heard the verdict, my initial r response, like, I missed them. I missed them so much because I wanted to go to them and tell them mm -hmm. what, what just happened, that we got justice for you, and I couldn't. The one survivor, the Absol's son, is only 11 now. His aunt and uncle helping to care for him, and they protect his privacy with all they have. There's, there's a little boy uh, who survived, mm -hmm. and um, I think people have been thinking about him. Certainly the uh, prayers uh, and the expression of support from people across the country has been instrumental for our family to get through this time. I'll say that he's... Um, happy and healthy and doing what an 11 year old should. Community support has been sustaining throughout and yes there is relief at the first degree murder convictions but that trial they say was utterly traumatizing and what is still unclear is whether the judge will rule the murders were motivated by hate that this was terrorism. Where we're at with this trial is is interesting and important because the judge has a decision to make, right, about whether it was terrorism that drove the first-degree murder charges. How important is that decision to you? Uh, for me, the, the terrorism label will bring some measure of security to many uh, minority communities. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the first time that uh, someone who uh, was born and raised in Canada has white skin, not part of an organization, uh, will be labeled a terrorist, and I, and I have full confidence that the judge uh, will will do just that. When I was growing up, the movies I watched, the TV I watched, I was uh, sort of taught to believe that a terrorist was a brown man uh, wearing uh, some turban, uh, yelling in a strange language with a machine gun, and that's not the case anymore. So. The next time that there's a Muslim family or an LGBT parade or a caravana uh, a celebration, whoever is out there with murderous intent, they may think um, twice. So this is home, and it will be home, but do you feel differently about your home? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would say, uh, no, I don't feel differently about home because uh, it's in my vested interest to make sure that uh, my country, our country, um, is the best it can be. The terrorists wanted to, to drive us apart based on uh, the skin color, a few millimeters of our uh, epidermis, but that's not what Canadians are. Um, uh, we're a country of decency, um, of politeness, uh, of respect, uh, we're a country where uh, you dig your neighbor out if they're, you know, in a snowdrift, or you drop food off at their home if they had an operation. It's our home, and we want to make it the best home possible. Um, I'd like to add to that. I do work with a lot of youth, and I worry for them. After this attack, my own children, they came to us struggling to process what their identity is as a Canadian. And 
my son said to me um, that if we, if a time ever comes that we have to leave Canada because we're not welcome here, he was 14 years old then, where do we go? Because he was born here. This is home. And when I heard that from my son, and I heard those sim similar sentiments from other youth, that worried me. And so to empower the youth, to, to let them know, no, no, your voice will be heard, became essential. I work with in the, the name of her lost family, of, in honor of them. Uh, Pina says as a psychotherapist, she wants to spend time and resources fighting Islamophobia. And so it's not as simple as you hear the guilty verdict and, okay, that's, that's good, we can move forward. For, for family, there's still a massive hole that will continue to exist. And now that this, the trial is done, I can put my energy towards working towards um, fighting hate. The killer tried to divide us, tried to isolate Muslims. That was his intention. And what I saw instead was humanity came out. There was a convergence of humanity. People from different faiths, different colors, different walks of life, they were there at that intersection. Every time I would walk there, there, there would be people hugging us, supporting us. That's where humanity came out. And I, I wish, my hope is that we can take that humanity, take the, the momentum and, and continue it forward. So it will be up to the Superior Court Justice to make that call on whether the attack amounted to terrorism. She will base that on all the evidence presented in court during the upcoming sentencing process. The family is asking for that hearing to be moved from Windsor to London where the attack happened. You can imagine the victim impact statements will be powerful.